The first man who, having enclosed a piece of ground, bethought himself of saying, This is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the real founder of civil society. From how many crimes, wars, and murders, from how many horrors and misfortunes might not anyone have saved mankind by pulling up the stakes or filling in the ditch and crying to his fellows, Beware of listening to this impostor. You are undone if you once forget that the fruits of the earth belong to us all, and the earth itself to nobody. And that quote comes from Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I will be your host for the next hour. In looking at the world today, and in looking at the responses of the general population towards any given situation, what becomes very apparent is that one of the main things that perpetuates the control system under which we find ourselves living today is the subliminal social programming of the population. People within our societies operate in very programmed ways, whether they know they do so or not. They actually do. When you look at any situation that's given to the population, very often people have a programmed response to these situations. And this is because people have spent most of their lives undergoing subliminal programming, conditioning and indoctrination without their knowledge. Because when you look at the world today, folks, you really do realise that we've got a lot of problems, we've got a lot of issues here, and no matter how much we create movements or sign petitions or vote people in or vote people out, nothing really ever seems to change. No matter what we do, I mean, when you look at the general population, in the hearts of the people there is an overall feeling that we want good and we want peace and we want change, but no matter how much we try to get it, it just never happens. There's always some reason why we don't go in a direction that we all want to go. Because as I said, you find that most of the general consensus is that we should be moving in a certain direction. But no matter how hard we try, we always seem to be moving the opposite way. And a lot of people notice this, but most of the general population just don't seem to, folks. It's quite amazing. People will repeatedly do the same thing and they'll expect a different result. But they keep going down the same path and the same avenues. When we see a problem in our society, we keep trying to find remedy by the same methods, which have proven not to work, no matter how many times we've used them. So one would have to question why we have such short memories and and just forget that it didn't work the first time, why would we expect it to work the second time? In regard to legal issues, in regard to your mortgage, in regard to issues you have with the council and issues you have with the government, You try to find legal remedy and there just isn't any legal remedy and yet we continue to do the same things. When we're faced with these problems, we continue to go down the same paths. And meanwhile, in our lives and in our societies, as a general population, we seem to be intent on pursuing completely meaningless activities all the time and attempting to reach certain rungs on the social ladder. And folks, really, I mean, when I look at the world today, I sometimes wonder whether we are living in a society or whether we are living in a circus. Because as I said, I mean honestly folks, the superficial things that people seem to spend their lives doing and indulging in and the way people are puppeteered and the way public reaction is moulded and all of the way people are controlled, it just, it just never ceases to amaze me. And really, folks, what causes most of it is the social programming that the people within society are kept locked into. It's very deliberately done and it's very meticulously done, and it's something that most people are very much unaware of, but it's there everywhere in their day-to-day life. People are always reacting in a controlled way. They're always finding themselves doing certain things, and they often don't know why they do them. They're doing things in order to fit in with the social scheme of things, And they're always programmed to react in certain ways to certain situations. They may not realize that they are, but they very often are. And society is very much puppeteered this way. And it's a great method of keeping people distracted as well, because while people are focused on one particular event, 
you will always find that there is something going on in the other direction while they're not paying attention. And folks, I'm sorry, and as much as I'd really like to avoid the topic, there seems to be no way that I can't mention the Trayvon Martin case at this point because what we've seen in the Trayvon Martin case and the ever so predictable and ever so programmed responses we've seen from the population in this theatrical news story, it's kind of like wag the dog, only it's wag the racial dog. I mean, folks, really, the controlling hand has almost stooped to the level of a B-grade movie with all of this. I mean, it's so predictable and it's so obvious what's going on. And it's so amazing to see how programmed the people are in their responses to the situation. And, folks, look, the Trayvon Martin Zimmerman thing, it's not an important issue. People get killed all the time. Yes, it's a terrible thing that this person died and it's terrible that the person shot him as well. But it's not an important issue. And the only reason the mainstream media is focusing so much attention on this case is because it promotes racial division. It gives people an excuse to take out their pent-up frustrations on the guy next door rather than noticing what's actually going on around them. I mean, look at the timing for one thing, folks. The timing of this Trayvon Martin Zimmerman verdict could not be more impeccable, could it? I mean, the United States government has just been caught spying on the entire planet, or should I say colluding with a number of Western governments in spying on the entire planet. There's a Western-backed al-Qaeda coup going on in Syria that is financed by the West and could even bring about the start of World War III. And just stop for a minute to really let that sink in, folks. We've got al-Qaeda, who is... A terrorist organization, apparently, so we're told, responsible for bringing down the Twin Towers, the world's most wanted terrorist organization, and here they are, infiltrating into Syria and staging terrorist attacks against the government, and all of it is backed by the United States, and it's backed by Western governments, and we've decided that we should support the rebels because they're the good guys. This is al-Qaeda, folks. Just let that sit with you for a little while. This is what President Obama and his supporters are, financing and supporting and this is the direction they wish to take the planet now not to mention the fact that the united states president is in office without a proper birth certificate and we've got illegal wars going on in iraq we've got war posturing towards iran we've got what's going on in palestine we've got the amount of people being killed by drone strikes in pakistan we've got drones being deployed over u.s cities we've got torture that's been legalized in the united states We've got secret prisons with people in there charged of no crime, just suspected of being something that they may or may not be. We've got the Bradley Manning case and the whole fiasco that goes along with it, along with numerous other issues of equal importance. And what the media is focusing on and what the people are focusing on is the Trevon Martin case. What is wrong with this picture? In fact, folks, I've even seen people within the alternate research community that seem to be giving a great deal of attention to the Travon Martin case and discussing whether the verdict was good or whether it was bad, when, folks, really the verdict was irrelevant. The verdict was going to bring about a racial clash whichever way it was played simply because of the amount of attention that the media has been putting on the case. That's why the case is so prominent it isn't about the verdict it's about the fact that it was people from two different races who were involved in the altercation to begin with and it's a great way of pitting one section of the community against another section of the community so that you can get away with all this other stuff while the people are kept busy and distracted fighting amongst themselves And in fact, folks, apart from letting war and corruption proliferate by the fact that no one is paying attention to what's going on outside of their borders and in the rest of their country, the other thing it will bring about is more police power and more police crackdowns and more police on the street and greater powers to the Department of Homeland Security. Because, of course, the police are going to need more powers and more people in order to deal with the terrible race riots that are happening around the country due to this case. 
And as I said, folks, this is, of course, why the media is giving it so much attention. Problem, reaction, solution. They do it every time, folks. The scary part about it is how often people simply buy into the same programming. Because it is, folks, it's social programming. People are giving programmed responses to these events, and it's all designed to further the globalist agenda and further the lockdown of society, to further the police state, to give the government more powers and to push forward towards things such as Agenda 21 and transhumanism. And the programming that people are subject to, it starts very, very deep. It starts very early in our lives. In fact, we are subject to social programming in almost every aspect of our lives. It starts with our own family life when we're born because, of course, we're born into families that are already pre-programmed. And then we go into an education system, which is really simply an indoctrination system, And this further programs us, and then we go out into society, and we're programmed in society. One of the most effective tools, of course, though, is television, because television is able to subliminally program people into programmed, controlled responses to any situation. This is very clever, the way they do this. It's done through subtext in films, and it's done through subtle subtext that you see in talk programs and in news programs, the way news anchor people react and the body language they use with each other, all sorts of things, folks. These things are done in order to elicit programmed responses from people and to program people into what to think rather than how to think. None of our society and none of our education system is really about teaching people how to think unless it's teaching them how to think about things in a left brain analytical way, so perhaps through the form of mathematical or scientific problems, architectural problems and construction problems and things like this, all the sorts of things that stimulate the left brain, never anything that stimulates the right brain. In fact, everything they do is designed to not only leave out any stimulation to the right brain, but it's designed to actually atrophy the right brain. And not only that, but to also shut down the corpus callosum, which is the axonal fibers in your brain, which cause your left and right brain to talk to one another. You see, they don't want people thinking about their lives artistically, folks. They don't want people thinking about reality artistically. They want to separate you from the art of your life and lock you within a left brain analytical system. And I've spoken about this very, very often. But that is what the social programming is for. Because really, when you look at it, folks, there's no reason for us to have a society that functions according to the parameters of this society. This society is based solely on an economic model. And it's only able to function and perpetuate the economic model because of its ability to separate and divide the people within the social structure of this system. And again, this is all done through social programming, which we are subject to in every aspect of our lives. And you think about it, folks, the economic division, the social hierarchy, and division really in all aspects of our social systems, folks, and division in in the type of car you drive, the type of clothes you wear, what your political or religious beliefs are, what your skin colour is, what sort of music you listen to, who your favourite sports team is. There's so many things that are designed to perpetuate division within our society while at the same time satisfying our naturally tribal instincts and our need for association with those of like mind and like belief and like interests. So it creates little pockets and little groups within society which are all separated from each other. And it also causes people to want to be attracted to those with similar likes and similar beliefs because you need to have that reinforcement of a group around you. It takes the individuality away from you. It takes the personal experience away from you because obviously it's very threatening out there. You've got all of these other people who believe different things, who wear different clothes, drive different cars, live on a different rung of the social hierarchy. And so you have all of this separation, and so it can be very dangerous and dark and lonely out there until you find a group with which you can identify with. And this, of course, is a tribal instinct. 
And our society very much promotes these type of situations and promotes these type of relationships that people have with each other because it gives them something external to themselves to cling on to while separating themselves from not only the community at large but also from their real self, from their inner self. It prevents them from seeing the true art of themselves and it causes them to identify that artistic expression with the group that they belong to. You'll find there's very few people that truly like their own company. I mean, there are some. I actually know quite a lot of people who very much enjoy their own company. But in society in general, it's actually quite rare to find people who really like that time alone. I mean, everybody needs time out, of course, but but most people in this society prefer to function in social groups. Everybody's got a best friend or a close group of friends that they hang around with and they do things together. And though people do have time out and do have time on their own, very few people really enjoy it and, and very few people really find the time that they spend alone to be a philosophical time or a time for reflection or a time for inner growth. Many of them just see it as a time when they can do the things that they don't like to do in front of other people. Maybe watch their favourite television show or listen to some music that nobody else likes or whatever other indulgence that they have that they like to hide from the world. That's very often what people do with their alone time. And really such times are very useful and can be very beneficial in helping you connect with the true art of yourself. And again, folks, this all comes down to social programming. Programmed responses to given situations and a loss of personal input via a loss of personal art or even the knowledge of your own art and the knowledge of the art of your existence. We're just not taught these things. We're not ever given a true vision of what reality is, not through our education system and certainly not through our social systems. And the Trayvon Martin case is really a very good example of this, folks, because the government is in so much difficulty at the moment. Governments around the world are in so much difficulty, and they need things that are going to distract the population. And a racial issue is perfect for this, folks, because racism and and the, the oppression of different races and the oppression of different ethnic groups, these are things that are driven heavily into the hearts of the people. We have a very long history of racial oppression and of oppression of different ethnic groups and different minority groups and so when people see someone else harmed and they are able to read race into it it hits very deeply in their hearts and it grabs them and it creates a groundswell in the people because it's something that people can identify with it's something that people can see right in front of their faces and it's something that they can believe that they can do something about at least they can have an effect Because, as I said, you can go and attack the guy next door now because he might have a different skin colour and you can release some of that pent-up emotion and pent-up frustration that you feel and that everybody feels as a result of this society. Because humankind has been disconnected from themselves so much and disconnected from their potential and disconnected from what they should be that most people inside harbour a lot of inattention. They don't really know why it's there. They just know reality shouldn't be the way it is because they're struggling so hard. Everybody feels dissatisfied inside. Even those who have managed to accumulate a lot of wealth often feel quite dissatisfied inside because no matter how much wealth they have managed to accumulate, it still hasn't brought them to themselves. It still hasn't given them what they wanted. You know, people are given a certain view of what their life will be if they follow this certain path, but when they get there, it's never the way it looked in the magazine. It's always never quite what they expected it to be, and they're always missing something, and what they're missing is themselves, because they've always been programmed to search for themselves and search for satisfaction and gratification and success and growth and happiness in things which are external to themselves. And again, folks, this is the result of social programming. So because people have reached these pinnacles and because people haven't reached these pinnacles and their life is not the way it should be or not the way they believe it should be, not the way it appears in the magazine anyway, then people feel very dissatisfied 
with themselves. They don't know what the problem is. Very often they feel that they are of lesser worth than other people because they haven't managed to accumulate as much stuff as other people. So they judge themselves poorly. And many people feel a lot of pent-up frustration and a lot of pent-up emotions. And this is why things such as the Trayvon Martin case are so easy to use against the population and so easy to dangle in front of the population like a carrot, which gives them a release for those pent-up emotions. And it's a release that can, as I said, be directed at the person next door simply because he has a different skin colour. So it's perfect for the system to use situations like this. And this is exactly what they're using it for. And they do these sorts of things all the time when they find themselves in hot water the way they are with this whole NSA debacle and all of the stuff that's going on in the United States at the moment. This is a perfect distraction to keep the people occupied with something on the street that they can go out and hit themselves rather than focusing their attention on the criminality in government. And it's even, dare I say it, folks, this same criminality which even caused the Trayvon Martin situation to happen because these crimes only happen because people are kept in a state of scarcity and kept in a state of division and are kept enslaved to a ridiculous social system which is designed to nurture and reward sociopathic behaviour. The Trayvon Martin case is a direct result and an expected result of such a society, so it all really comes down to the same problem, doesn't it? And that is the social programming which keeps this situation in place. Some of the most interesting type of programming that takes place, though, folks, is, as I said, on the television and in movies. The subtext in movies, in modern movies, is absolutely phenomenal. It places suggestions in people's minds of who the enemy will be, what the enemy will look like, what you should feel about certain situations, how you should think, how you should dress, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And really, look, I think there's a lot of people that are aware of this type of program, and I think there's a lot of people that are becoming aware that their lives are very much controlled by the suggestions of others and their beliefs are very much controlled by the suggestion of others and people are starting to wake up to the fact that there's something terribly wrong and what we have to do folks is we have to find a way out of this situation we have to find a way of reining things in and getting the system back on track and that's what I've been attempting to do with these radio shows is offer suggestions on how to look at yourself and how to look at this reality and what steps we could take to improve our situation here. Now, very obviously, we can't do it through political means. We've tried to do it through political means for a great number of years now. We've been voting people in, voting people out. Many people with the best of intentions have even entered into the political arena, and they've ended up corrupted by the system. And when I say corrupted, I don't mean to say they were turned into a dishonest person. What I mean is they were simply forced to operate via corrupt parameters in a corrupt system. I mean, the system is inherently corrupt. It's dysfunctional. So when you enter into that arena and you're forced to operate within those parameters, then anything you may try to accomplish is corrupted by default simply because of the parameters in which it's forced to operate. So you can't enter into that system. There's no point entering into that system. We've tried that. It doesn't work. We've tried petitions. We've tried protests, we've tried revolutions where we've pulled down one government and we've put up another government. We've tried replacing leaders, we've tried impeaching the executive office, we've tried all sorts of things and we never seem to get to where we want to go. As I said earlier, no matter what we try to do, even though the general consensus is the same across the board, everybody agrees that things are going in a bad direction and we need change, we never seem to be able to bring about that change. And what I've been attempting to suggest on these radio shows is that the reason we never have the success that we want in bringing about this change is because we are always operating within the parameters of this system and what we need to do is step above it. And folks, a lot of people have had difficulty with this. They've had trouble with the concept of what it would be like to step above the system and hold the government in breach of trust and say, well, have you tried that? How did it work out for you? And the thing is that I can't do it on my own. I need the rest of the population with me. 
the whole population needs to stand up and do this. And I believe that the only way they're going to do it is by understanding who and what they are personally. I think it's a personal issue. I think that everybody has to rediscover themselves so that they can see the farcical reality that they're forced to endure and they can see the possibility that they can do something about it simply through the weight of numbers because the people that are doing all this, the people in government, are just people in government. They're just our employees. That's all they are. They don't actually own the system. They don't actually own us. They don't own the wealth of this nation. Nobody owns the wealth of the nation. The nation, you know, the country is, is the country. Nobody owns the earth. You might be the custodian of a piece of it for a while, but you don't own it. I mean, it's a, just a different way of looking at things, but I'm probably getting off topic. But what I'm trying to say here, folks, is that we do need change, but the change has got to come from the people. And it's only going to come when the people discover themselves. And the only way we're going to ever get that to happen is to start respecting ourselves and respecting the people around us. I've been focusing on this quite a bit lately because I really do believe it is the answer. And we're getting at a crucial time in history here. We're getting at a time when the people really do need to pay attention. But what are they going to be paying attention to? That is the question. And really, they need to pay attention to themselves and realize their own potential, realize what they are, because once they do that, they have the ability to see that in other people and we can unite as a community we can stand up and we can rein this system in in one day we can demand transparency in our government we can change the direction everything is going if we choose to participate en masse and we can do it in one day but it has to be done in a peaceful and respectful manner that's the only way we can do it you know we've got to realize that these people that are running the country they're just like kids that are out of control we've got to slap them on the wrist and put the ship of state back on course because it's certainly not at the moment but i think it's break time here folks i'll have to leave it there for now it's a pleasure having your company on the air today and i'll speak to you again in a few minutes thanks for listening and welcome back ladies and gentlemen so if people can become aware of the social programming that surrounds them then half the battle is won already just because they're aware of the programming and it's important that people do become aware of the programming, folks, because as I've often said, you can't fix a problem until you become aware that a problem exists. The mere knowledge of the problem's existence then provides you with the opportunity that you need to address the problem, because all of these things are just opportunities, really, when you look at it from that perspective. And so once you see the social programming, you have an opportunity to step above it, become aware of it, become aware of yourself. And that's where you begin to see where the remedy is, because the remedy lies above the system. It's the social programming that keeps people in the belief that the system is real, that the system enslaves them. And on an individual level, in many ways, it does. But if we were to suddenly respect each other and to step above the system and have that faith that we used to have in ourselves, that we should have in ourselves again, then we can find the remedy there. I really believe this. I really believe that if we were to act as a whole, we could fix this whole situation. We could fix every problem in the world if we were to simply act as one species, one unified species, and work to create a better future. I think that the psychopaths that are running the world would lose their control instantly if the population, the general population, were to come into their power. And again, the only reason the people don't come into their power is because they don't know that power is there. They don't know it exists because of the social programming they're subject to. Truly, I believe that one of the main keys is to become aware of the economic system, to become aware of the economic reality that's been superimposed over reality, the false economy that we're forced to adhere to and the state of scarcity that we're kept in because this is what keeps us on the treadmill and prevents us from noticing all the other stuff. And if we ever do notice, well, they just state something like the Trayvon Martin case so that we all get distracted with that issue, again, instead of really paying attention to what's going on. See, after the whole Trayvon Martin riots and all this stuff have simmered down again, everyone would have forgotten all about the NSA. They will have forgotten all about Edward Snowden. They will have forgotten all about Bradley Manning. 
They will have forgotten all about Iraq, forgotten all about all the other things, forgotten about the fact that the president doesn't have a birth certificate and isn't even an American. Forgotten about all this stuff. And that's what they use these things for. And you can always tell by the timing of these events what they're being used for as well, folks, because like I said, there's so much going on around the world at the moment that they need a distraction. And the easiest distraction that they've got is to play on people's racial issues because everybody has them because we've got a society which has promoted racial issues and ethnic issues and divisionism to every degree possible. It's been almost a work of art the way our society has become racially and ethnically divided and it's all done for this very reason. In fact about the only people that are going to benefit from the Trayvon Martin situation and the race riots that are happening is the Department of Homeland Security, folks, because they're going to be able to use it as an excuse to further militarise the police and to further lock down society. Not to mention the fact that while everybody is distracted with this issue, once they get back to normal, they're going to turn around and the world's going to be a very different place internationally as well because of what's happening in Syria and all the other issues that people simply aren't paying attention to. Again, folks, programmed responses to contrived situations. Okay, so how do we fix it, folks? Well, as I've been saying for six years, what we have to do is pay attention to both the international situation, pay attention to our national situation, what's going on in our own countries, but also pay attention to our local situation, pay attention to our communities and pay attention to ourselves. And I truly do believe it all comes down to respect and this respect comes from knowing who and what you are. Now recently I've been mentioning on the show a legal term called sui generis. Sui generis is a term which describes your uniqueness. And if you are a person of high integrity, folks, then your uniqueness should be all you need to establish with anybody. It should be all you need to establish with any legal system. It should be all you need to carry yourself through this system. Your uniqueness makes you who you are. And if you are a person of integrity, well, integrity has no need of rules. Integrity is integrity. And if you can view your own actions that way, and if you can always act in integrity in all that you do, then you begin to perceive what integrity is. And if then you are faced with a system which is not acting in a manner of integrity and whose rules do not contain integrity and is not an honourable system that is there to service mankind then where is the integrity in abiding by that system? There is no integrity in doing so. And not only that, then you need to look at the system and and ask yourself why this system exists in this form. Why is it in place? What was the mind that put this in place? Why would there be a social and legal system in place which removes integrity from the individual and which removes integrity and accountability from politicians? Why would such a system exist? And how does it continue to exist? You begin to ask these questions, folks. And then if you are a person who always acts in integrity, then by default you cannot abide by a system which does not contain the basic foundations of integrity or does not operate in a matter of integrity. And this system doesn't. This system inflicts itself upon everybody by its very nature simply by the fact that it imposes an economic system over the reality of every person in this social structure means that this system does not act in integrity, simply because this is a system that would create homelessness, that would put profits above people, and that would allow politicians to rape the resources of this planet and of this country while impoverishing the nation. This indicates that this is not a system of integrity, and so therefore a person of integrity is left with no other option than to refuse to comply with this system. In fact, folks, if this system did have any integrity, everybody in the country should receive a pension every week. Everybody in this country should receive a pension from the government simply to cover the cost of living that the government imposes upon the people. 
If the government is going to create and promote a system which ensures that people must pay to be alive, then it is only fair that the government cover the cost of that debt. That basic cost of having a roof over your head, having electricity hooked up to your house and having food on the table, the government should cover all of that. And then any work that you choose to do should be your own to do with what you will. After all, it is the government that has imposed the system of scarcity upon the people, and if the government was to act in integrity in any way, it would cover that debt by default, but it doesn't. So that should tell you something very important about the moral structure of your government as well. And people might find difficulty with that, saying, well, why should everyone receive a pension? Well, I would say that everyone should receive a pension simply because, as I said, this system of government is such a system that it has superimposed an economic model over the minds of the people and is superimposed an economic value over every person whereby every person within this society is forced to live in a situation whereby they must pay to be alive and pay to access the abundance that this planet freely provides to mankind were it not for the economic model that these governments have superimposed over reality. And that's why the government should cover the cost. Of course they should. Of course it would be best to remove the cost altogether because I think the mere concept that people have to pay to live on the planet they were born on is ridiculous to the extreme. But that's just one example and one way of looking at things again. I find it very annoying when people think that everybody should work and that it's all about jobs and that's what the government should do is they need to provide jobs because I believe that people should be asking the question of why do we need the jobs in the first place? Why do I have to go and get a job in a factory or a job digging ditches or a job laying pipes or a job working for somebody else in some company simply in order to collect the paper that I need to be alive? Why can't I go and work at a job somewhere where I am able to express the art of myself and experience the art of my life, the art of creation, the art of the life around me and the art of the people around me? Why can't I be in a situation where myself and all of the people around me are free to explore our artistic and creative potential to see where human consciousness could go, to see what direction mankind could actually be taken in and what we could achieve if we were a united and respectful community who was able to express all of their creative potential. To me, that's what reality should be, and that's what I am striving to see in the future. And all of this has been removed from our experience via the imposition of the economic model. And that's why I find the economic model so abhorrent, folks. I really do. Of course, it's something that we all need at the moment, we can only survive by collecting paper and spending this paper, transferring paper all around the planet so that we can have a roof over our heads and food on the table. And it really is quite ridiculous that this is what the human experience has been reduced to. And of course, folks, it is the reduction of the human experience to a state of commerce which provides the glue to hold this entire slavery system together. And they keep tightening this slavery system up, folks. They're making it more and more difficult for people to get by in the world. They're making it more and more difficult for people to find professions that they love. They're attempting to take naturopaths off the register here in Australia. They don't want people performing natural remedies. They don't want anyone thinking holistically or working to experience the art of themselves in any way if they can help it. They are making worthwhile jobs and jobs of integrity more and more scarce while increasing the cost of living and forcing people to do things that they don't like to do, destroying the human spirit in every way they possibly can. And they've really reduced the first world to a spiritual consciousness whereby these people will do anything they can in order to collect the paper they need to survive because they are completely convinced the paper is real. This is why we're seeing the transfer of wealth now from the first world into the third world, because the people in the first world will do anything they want. They've lost most of their family connection. They've lost any real connection to each other spiritually or 
or any real social wholeness, any real community spirit. It's, it's gone from most Western societies, unless you still find it sometimes in small towns. But within major cities, there is no communal spirit. There is nothing to unite the people. And it's getting more and more cutthroat. And this is all being done by design folks. Because as I said, it keeps people distracted and it keeps them on the treadmill. It prevents them from waking up and it causes them to be always focused on the collection of paper and always locked into a state of fear-based mind control whereby they become fixated on survival and very little else holds any real meaning for them. And again, folks, this is all a result of social programming. And really, folks, what it's all about, as I've so often said, is division. And divisionist programming really is being pushed upon human consciousness, and it's coming from all directions, folks. We're virtually bombarded with it all the time, simply through the economic system and through the social systems, through the tribal traditions that are deep inside us as well, the need to belong to a certain sports team or a certain car club or a certain social group. These are all tribal things. And the reason I believe that we reach out for these tribal things is because we are so locked into a dysfunctional system that I think we're searching for anything. We're searching for anything that we can find with which to identify with. We're looking for some security blanket whereby there are people there who think like us and who we trust and who will act in predictable ways so that we don't have to be scared of them or worried about them or really think for ourselves in any way. We don't have to worry about how to act because we know how to act in the company of these people and it provides some solace for people an escape if you will from their dysfunctional lives and i think many people need this and they really don't want to know about what the bigger problems are because they're already worried enough about collecting paper they're worried enough because they're locked into this economic and social system and that's really all that matters to them they just want to be in a position where they have the respect that they believe they need, but they believe that respect can only come through the collection of exterior possessions and external possessions. They don't ever believe that respect can come from the integrity of themselves because they don't get that respect from people because the people that they are dealing with are also programmed into the same reality that they are programmed into. You know, when you really step back and look at all this, folks, you see the enormous problems and the enormous hurdles that we have to overcome through the social programming that people are subject to. And as I said, it's not just social. We've got religious programming. We've got economic programming. We've got the educational programming. We've got the subtext that people are subject to all the time. And the way we program ourselves and we police ourselves, we police our own thoughts because we are living in this state of fear-based mind control, which affects us on so many levels to the extent where we are also in fear of what our friends think about us and those people around us may think if we were to offer them a view that may be outside of the box. So we police our own thoughts, we police what we do, and we live in a state where we have this huge cloud that seems to hang over human consciousness and we do everything we can to stay in our own little patch of sunlight and not let the cloud affect us. We don't want to look up and notice that it's there because we're scared that if we do, it may rain on us. And very often it does. Very often people who speak out against the system find themselves up against very adverse forces who will stop at nothing to silence them in what they say. That's why even doing what I do can be quite dangerous and many people who speak out against the system find that they do come up against severe difficulties. I've certainly had my share folks. I've had a number of situations arise since I started speaking out actually and they continue to arise. I've had all sorts of problems with donations and all sorts of problems with getting the message out to people. But I continue to persevere because I think it's an important message and it's an important time for humanity. And I really do believe that there are so many people around the planet now waking up and 
beginning to realise that all is not as they thought it was and that the system really does need our attention, that I simply can't stop now. I think it's too good a time to be alive. It's too important a time to be alive. And now more than ever, it's important for as many people as possible to stand up and be counted and to have their voices heard. The revelations of Edward Snowden and spying of the NSA has confirmed everything we've been saying for years. The situation in Syria, whereby we have al-Qaeda being funded by our governments, when these are apparently the world's most terrible terrorist organisation, this shows what our governments are prepared to do. The fact that coal seam gas mining is still happening all around the planet, despite the fact that it's destroying the water table and despite the huge public outcry regarding the practice, shows how little regard our governments have for the population of their country and how it's all about the economic model. And we've got riots and protests, huge, huge protests, the likes of which the world has never seen before, happening in many countries around the world. And all of this shows that there is a huge awakening and that the workings of the mechanism have been laid bare and that people all around the planet want change. So now we just have to think about what that change should be and how we are going to go about that change, what we intend to do from this point. But the most important thing in all of this, folks, is that we realise that it's time for us all to pay attention to what's going on around us. Now more than ever, that time has come. The time that we have waited for, for human consciousness to really shift and for the world to really start moving in a proper direction, a direction that is good and right and beneficial for not only mankind but for all life on the planet. That time is now. The time in history when mankind really stood up, stepped up to the plate, realised our potential and realised what we've done here, what we've allowed to be done in our name, what we've allowed to be constructed around us, which is simply a fictitious system of rules that have been written down by public trustees whom we, the people, employ to do the opposite of what they've done. And all of the posturing and all of the animosity that governments hold for each other and all of the contrived wars, it's all theatre, folks. It's just the governments. It's the banks and the governments posturing and creating situations whereby we, the people, believe that we need governance. We need people to look after us because everybody outside our borders, everybody on the other side of this fictitious line that somebody drew on a map is against us. But really, it's not true. Everywhere I've travelled around the world, I've met wonderful, caring people, all of who want peace, all of who are prepared to take you into their home and to feed you and to look after you and to get to know you, all of whom are just people, just like me. The problem doesn't come from nations and other people, folks. It doesn't come from people of other nationalities or people of ethnic groups. It comes from governments and bankers, and it's all contrived, and it's about time we paid attention. Well, we're getting close to the end of this show here, folks. Now, just as an update on a few issues as well, folks, I've had a lot of people emailing me and asking me about my progress with the Candida release program. And at this stage, I have been unable to finish the program. I did go halfway through the program, but then due to travel, I was unable to complete the procedure. And I haven't been able to get hold of a full treatment again in order to start the program again, in order to know what the finished result will be. Now, this is because of certain problems with the company that was distributing the Lafeneron, I believe. But suffice to say, my position with the whole thing is this. I found the person who was running the company to be lacking in integrity due to the amount of emails I received from people who had had problems with delivery of the product And so I removed the videos and I removed the links to the MP3 and removed the information about the product from the website because I did not want people buying from those three particular websites due to my recommendation simply because of the amount of complaints that I'd had. 
And that's why I removed that particular radio show from the Crow House website. Having said that, I do know people who have completed the program and they have had very positive results. I know one person who was able to get rid of a fungal problem that he'd had for many, many years and he tried numerous methods to get rid of it. He'd been unable to do so and the Lefeneron protocol had cured him of this fungal condition within about four days. And again, folks, it isn't just the Lefeneron, it's the actual dietary protocol combined with the MMS, combined with the zeolite that brought about the desired result. So my experience is that the program works, the protocol works, but I do not recommend that people buy from those three companies that were mentioned on that particular radio interview. I have some friends who are attempting to put together something now in order to be able to get the medicine out to you quite cheaply. So once I have a little bit more information about that, I will bring that to you on the radio show. Another issue that I've got at the moment is that PayPal is putting in new policies and new regulations and making it extremely difficult for people to be able to collect donations via PayPal. And so I've closed the donation button on the website. Thank you to anybody who has ever helped me with donations on the website. It really is the only thing that keeps it going. But I've had to close donations on the website now due to policy changes in PayPal. So it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to get any donations via PayPal anymore. So I'm trying to figure out another way of getting some form of donations up there and something else that I can set up in order to be able to keep donations coming in because without the donations, then there will be no Crow House and there will be no continuation of the radio show because it's the only thing that actually keeps me going. So I've really got to look into that. If anybody out there has any suggestions, it would be greatly appreciated if you could get in contact with me. But that donation section is closed at the moment, so I'm trying to look for other means. At the moment, the only way you can make a donation to the Crow House would be to send cash to P.O. Box 1803, Byron Bay, New South Wales, Australia. And the postcode for that is 2481. And that is the only way to get any donations to the Crow House at the moment. So I'll keep you posted when a new method comes to hand. So yes, things are certainly a little touch and go at the moment, folks. It's a very interesting time to be alive, that's for sure. But I will keep you posted on any information that comes to me regarding the Lefeneron protocol and the Candida release protocol. As I said, I don't recommend that you get involved in those three websites just because of the amount of emails I've had from people that have had difficulty in that regard. Again, the only reason I removed the videos was not because the protocol doesn't work, but because I do not wish to have my name associated with any type of company that people are having difficulty with. So again, I will keep you posted on that when a new source, a new reliable source becomes available, as will I keep you posted on when you are able to make donations via the Crow House again. Although there is one other possibility in that as well, folks. So there is a possibility that you could still go to the website and find a donate button there. If you do find a PayPal donate button on the website, then it will be operational and it will be fine to make a donation. There's a possibility that I may be able to access funds through the Send a Smile Foundation. So if you find a PayPal link to the Send a Smile Foundation and you specify Max Egan on the donation, you need to have no doubt that it will find its way to me. That is another possibility. That isn't there at the moment, but it's possible that it may get set up within the next couple of days. So just keep an eye on that one. And again, folks, any donations that anybody makes are greatly needed and greatly appreciated. But I think that's about the end of the show for me, folks. I'm going to have to leave it there. We're completely out of time. Thank you very much for the support you've shown me over the years. Thank you for joining me on the air every week the way you do. Thank you for your kind emails and thank you for applying the information to your own life the way I know many of you have done. It really is very gratifying and very humbling to know that people do take the information on board and they do make the personal change that is necessary to bring about external change in this convoluted world that we live in. And it, it's what the show is all about. It's what the message is all about. 
And really, it's, it's all about you. It's all about what you do with the information. So thank you very much for that as well. It's a pleasure to speak to you every week on the shows, folks, but that is it. And I will look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please take good care until then. In La Keshe.